Hello, and welcome to episode 415 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan, as always, joined by Evan Silva. And today we have a very, very special guest. This is a young man who somehow, young man. somehow, simultaneously, one of the most powerful lawyers in America and <laughs> one of the most feared high stakes fantasy football auction drafters. It is, of course, old friend of the show, Jack Hahn of Jack Hahn Law. Jack, how's it going, buddy? It's going well, especially after that introduction. Yes. Maybe one of the most powerful lawyers in Payless Heights, Illinois, but that's probably <laughs> my scope. Evan, good afternoon. How's it going? How's it going? I'm really excited to see Jack uh, next week at Kettle Strings in Oak Park, Illinois, where we're going to have, I'm hoping, six drafts. I ordered six draft boards where you you put the stickers on. You, there's like a ring that comes in each uh, you know, for, for the winner. And then there's a last place thing you have to wear around your neck. Um, last year we did four, but it rained. So we couldn't do any outside. Um, hopefully we'll get good weather this year and we'll be able to put two drafts outside four inside. Um, uh, but it's going to be an absolute blast. And, you know, anybody that's going to be in the Chicago area at that, uh, at that time, uh, please, you know, feel free to, to come by. Um, I know Jack will be talking a lot of smack cause that, that's how Jack rolls. That's half the fun is finding yeah, Elvin, exactly. uh, finding Evan and uh, criticizing his picks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Jack was telling me before the show that he thinks he can keep up with Evan drinking. I uh, admitted to him that I cannot. And so uh, I will not be in attendance. I will be uh, uh, doing, I don't know, virgin activities, but you guys have fun. It sounds great. On today's show, we're going to talk all things auction. It, auction really is so, so, so different than snake drafts. And I think it's really important to think that through before you get into yours. So we're going to talk all things macro and micro about auction drafts today. Also, as you know, it is officially fantasy draft season. You're going to see a lot of people out there pushing their rankings, pushing their auction values. Everyone's got them. I've seen some laughable stuff out there. No one is taking our auction values and rankings for drafts as serious as us, we're updating every bit of news, every target share, carry projections, literally down to the decimal point. All that flows through to our auction values. It makes sure when your draft comes, you have the most up-to-date info. Also, this podcast is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. This $2 million to first, $1 million second place best ball tournament on a $25 buy-in is still running, still open. Visit Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code ETR for $100 in free entries. Underdog Fantasy, promo code ETR. All right, Jack. Maybe the people should have a little background on you. I mean, I, there's season-long grinders out there, which my eyes have been open to, actually, about this whole kind of subculture of season-long grinders. I'm so deep in the DFS space that maybe I don't see it as clearly. But then even within this subset of season-long grinders, there's like high-stakes auction grinders. Jack is like traveling the circuit around the country in these high-stakes auction drafts. What a life. Jack, Jack, why don't you tell the people a little bit about your background with auctions and, and how many auctions and how much you're playing for each year? Well, I don't think I'm going to disclose how much I'm playing for each okay. year because not even the wife knows that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but but she knows uh, when I win, right? Perfect. Um, and then I buy her something. But yeah, um, this year I'm going to head to New York on September 2, do an auction and a few drafts out there. The next weekend I'm heading to Vegas where I'll have at least four or five auctions over the course of four days. Uh, these are higher entry priced leagues. Um, so it's a lot of fun, takes a lot of planning. Uh, I'll, I'll do some online auctions too. definitely do that to prepare. You know, I've been doing auctions for 15 or 16 years at this point. Um, I actually, I started with, um, the very first national competition when WCOFF started in like 2002, I was out there and made it to Vegas every year since then, except last year when my when my son was going through football recruiting. So, and I was just too busy with work. So um, yeah, going back this year, going to hit it hard and ready to do some auctions. Uh, why do you like auction? I know you said you play some snake also, but, but why do you grind the, the auctions or do you think the edge is bigger in auction? Because I, I actually think people come in unprepared for an auction. It's real hard to get caught up. You can get caught up relatively quickly on snake. It's pretty hard to get caught up 
for auction is that is the edge bigger is that why you grind the auction you know i don't think the edge is bigger in the in these high stake auctions that i do in vegas and new york these guys are good and they're really informed and have great strategies too if there's some advantage it comes in your recognition of prices who's underpriced the guys you like and you hope you're right right? You, you, you take your projections, you see what numbers are out there and you start putting together plans and hopefully take advantage of some of the opportunities that you see. Uh, there's just so much more thought and constant second decisions that you got to make in auctions. That's what makes it so much more fun to me. It's basically three hours of nonstop decision making. Mm -hmm. By the second constant adjustments, am I going to bid one more? And you got to make those, you know, fast, quick decisions constantly and adjust on the fly. So that's one of the great things. But also there's just so many ways to put teams together. Right. Do you think that, that do you think that your profession kind of correlates with, uh, you know, your I mean, because you're obviously making a lot of decisions as a lawyer, as an attorney, I would think. Does it kind of like lead you into the auction format or does you think it helps you or do you think there's any relation there? Well, I think the only portion that overlaps is the competition okay because i'm a litigation yeah. attorney i hate losing and when it, i'm really competitive so uh it's easy to look for those competitive advantages in auction drafts which to me are much harder to do and require more strategy and thought than the, sn the snake drafts one thing that i would say about auction is simply it's more fair right like i i want to have i don't know jonathan taylor i want to have christian mccaffrey like if i don't get a top four pick it's over, you know, I, and in auction, obviously you can do that. And, and to me, that's one of the biggest appeals for sure. I also agree with what Jack said. You can make all kinds of different teams. You know, we're going to talk about different types of roster constructions here that you can do balance stars and scrubs, all kinds of things that you can do in auction that you can't do in snake either. So anyways. Well, one of the things I would just say is uh, the thing I, I really love is I get to be aggressive as much as I can, especially at the beginning of, of the auction. So that's another part, I guess that's a, litigation trade is how aggressive you're going to be to make your great your game plan work all right so i think it's easy to get paralyzed when you're preparing for an auction in other words it's easy to throw your hands up and say oh well i don't know what my opponents are going to do so how can i even prepare right i'm just going to have to kind of take it as it comes we have these auction values that we have on each yard wherever you get them from and, and we'll go to the draft and we'll figure it out from there so i think there's some paralyzation in preparing for an auction how would you suggest people prepare for their auction draft? Yeah, the, the number one criteria for me is you have to get accurate sale prices for the players. Number one, uh, it, it depends what auction you're doing, uh, if, if that information could be available. You know, some sites who run auctions have that information compiled with average auction value so you can utilize that. Like the NFFC has – a great resource for that. But they that would be the equivalent of like ADP essentially, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they'll give you the high and low and the median also. So you know what the, the middle price is and what's the high for, and you can put whatever time frame you want in there, the last week, the last month of auctions. Cause you know, things get really, uh, they changed a lot over this time right now as we're going through training camp. So prices can go up and down on guys. But when it comes to the prices, to me, that's the number one factor because when you know the prices, that's how you start your game planning going forward. So you have to find the most accurate information that you can for the type of league that you're in, size, starting lineup requirements, um, you know, how many flexes you have. And some of that information is fairly easily available online and other times you have to search for it. I talk about that more in the article that I wrote for ETR. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys haven't seen it yet, Jack wrote a really, really good article about auction that's up in the draft kit right now. What about people who are just in like a Yahoo? You know, like I play in a Yahoo auction league with my boys from high school. Yahoo gives you, I believe it's suggested price or it might be average price, like ADP. I'm not sure. Is there anywhere to find just like, hey, this is a, a home league. I'm, we're playing on Yahoo. It's not high stakes. It's just we're just doing a Yahoo, uh, uh, an auction with our boys. Um, where would you suggest finding sale prices for that? Yeah, I, to be honest, I haven't played a Yahoo auction league for a long time, so I don't know if their prices are fairly accurate, if that's 
information they compile and mm-hmm. use, or if that's just their own suggested prices. So um, I'd probably follow that, do a mock draft on Yahoo and see if that's what prices typically go for yeah. just to get some idea. Okay. So once you have these sale prices on NFFC or wherever, FFPC, I, I don't even know, um, mm-hmm. then what? You have these sale prices and I assume you have some take on how much you should spend or you want to spend on each player, right? Yeah. My, the, the thing that I actually developed all by myself over the years, but now I see other guys recommending the same type of thing is I, I put together game plans for an auction. So let's say I'm, I'm doing one of the high stake auctions for the FFPC in Vegas, which I, which I will be. So I have completed drafts from FFPC rules and I can take those numbers, see where guys are, selling for and and over the years these numbers have been highly accurate for the actual sales prices once i'm out there so then i know well let's just take uh one player let's just say christian mccaffrey and let's just say 60 dollars. if he's selling for 60 i am confident that that's the price give or take a couple dollars that he's going to go for so i start putting together all kinds of different iterations of starting lineup requirements of players of running backs, wide receivers, and just start putting guys in and out. I mean, basically I'll start with who are the guys that are the guys I really want to buy and how much Mm -hmm. will that be? So I'll plug them in and start doing math. Mm -hmm. What do I have left? You know, if I'm shooting for, um, let's just say $175 on 10 starters, right? Including a kicker and a defense dollar each splitting up the rest for the remaining eight starters, how am I going to do that? And I will, I'll put together a number of different game plans based on guys that I want more than anyone. And then seeing who else fits in there and you got to just play with the numbers and continue to just do different ones. Cause I, I've, I've worked those for a couple hours at a time and all of a sudden I'll come across one that goes, Oh yeah, that, no, that's a, that's one that gets the juices flowing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of like DFS where we have set prices, you know, it's not, the prices aren't dynamic to opponent. Mm-hmm. We have set prices, but we're always looking for the perfect combination that we like yeah. uh, in, in DFS. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned how, 100. How, let, let me ask you, how often, so you, you admit that, you know, you go into every draft with guys that you love. I mean, we all love, you know, we have targets that when we enter the draft, right. Yep. How often do you find yourself bidding on guys that you didn't enter the draft targeting um, either number one to drive the the sale price up or just because you're like, ah, this guy's just too cheap. I don't really love him, but he's, but he's too cheap right now. Well, the guy might be too cheap, but if he doesn't fit in my plan, mm-hmm. the best I'll do is price enforce a little bit and then drop out. So when I put a plan together, I might have a starting lineup, but I always have backups that are comparable in their position. So I might have a, um, let's just say a $18 receiver, let's say Rashad Bateman plugged into my plan and then backing it up, there might be a guy and I'm just throwing out names that might be similar like Cortland Sutton behind him or another one so that I'm not just going to sit there and wait for Rashad Bateman, even though he's mm-hmm. the preferred, because if the bat, one of the backups come up and his price is good and he's going to fit in the plan, I, I snap it up. Because you never know what's going to happen going down the road. And if Bateman's one of the last guys in the tier that's going to get uh, nominated, he's probably going to go for two or three more dollars than I had budgeted. So I look for those replacements, and I'm not afraid to bid and buy if he fits in the plan. Uh, you said, you know, I know you're just throwing out numbers, but 175, I assume, out of 200 for, for yeah. starters. Is yeah. that Would you advise that to novice auction players you should not be spending a lot on your bench one or two dollars most for all your bench spots well now we're talking whether we like um stars and scrubs versus balanced approach yeah well yeah and and yeah i wanted to ask about stars and scrubs too i was just asking more about your bench but yeah go go ahead on that yeah well typically for me i'm gonna spend somewhere between 170 and 175 on starting lineup i will budget those numbers and ideally i will budget a 170 number for my starters and if i pay a couple extra dollars it still fits within that range but if i'm saving some dollars along the way then i know i have extra for a, an 
the, another starter that could go for two dollars more and i keep yeah. track religiously of where i'm at so if i buy one for two extra dollars i'll write a plus two so i know whether i need to go up or down along the way yeah and we'll get to end game in a second because i do think having money left over for the end game i think is somewhat valuable but we'll get uh jack's take on that here in a second i want to go back to uh roster construction and specifically stars and scrubs because uh, it's my favorite way to play auction it's usually my favorite way to play dfs when it makes sense, like I think I can grind the one and two dollar players better than my opponents. Like I think that's where my edge is, right? Everybody knows, you know, Gabe Davis or Rashad Bateman. Like every, like you said, they're going to go around the same price. I think I'm personally better at the one and two dollar guys than my opponents. That's my edge. I don't know if you see that as an edge for yourself, also, or what do you think about stars and scrubs versus some of these balanced builds? Yeah, I watched over the years when I first started in auctions, and the guys who were winning more consistently were the guys who did stars and scrubs. And so I learned from that and I started to do that more as well. And that's just the style that fits me. I'm always going to have at least two or three foundational players to be anchors in my lineup. So I'm always looking for who, who that's going to be. It changes from year to year with positions, depending on what the inventory of players is, but I, that's the way I do it. And so um, I have found that success. I'd rather go with the guys that I've watched win and the way that they do it and learn from it um, and implement that. And it's worked well for me too. Yeah. I mean, the way to get outsized payoffs is on cheap guys, right? Like, let's say somebody has a really good year at $20. Well, that's great, but it's not as big as a payoff as someone with a really good year at $2. Obviously, those guys are harder to find, but we'll get to some of these one and two dollar yeah, guys here. That's right. Well, you, there's different strategies that win. I've seen I've seen balanced approach win as well. I just think it's harder. Yeah. For that reason, you have to be right on those guys and your probabilities of them being one of those blow up players, I think, is lower. I'd say one thing that I think is good for balance is that it's a long NFL season and you will almost certainly have a deeper team. If you go balanced, you know what I mean? Like you'll have, a, you, you may not have as high a ceiling team, but you'll have a deeper team maybe to get you through the season. Uh, well, it, I should qualify this by saying it depends on how many uh, teams are in your league too. Yeah. Uh, I play in a 14 team auction league in the NFFC. That's the hardest auction I do because that's an inventory of 280 players that need to be purchased with a starting lineup of 10. And that's just an all out war mm -hmm. for, for the, that bidding. Cause the bidding is higher. Uh, it's, it's a, just so much fun because of that, but yeah. you need a little bit more balance in those leagues because there's so few guys available on the waiver wire as you go along during the season. Let's talk about this year specifically with roster construction. What developments are you seeing in team constructions in auctions for this year, the 2022 fantasy football season? Yeah, this is a really interesting one to me because I think for the first time in many years, there are actually values in the running backs, in, in the top running backs. I mean, I haven't seen this for a long time. You know, you kind of see it in even the redrafts where guys have talked um, on Twitter and online about some three running back um, constructions in the first three rounds, you know, Dwayne McFarland's talked about it in his tweets and I've, I've actually messaged him about it because I'm like, I saw the same thing. And um, I'm seeing that in pricing in auctions as well. That's actually attainable with what I'm seeing. For example, you know, McCaffrey was selling when he was healthy two years ago, he was selling for 65, $67. And I was in an auction uh, 10 days ago or so where I bought him for 54. And I'm like, that's the same Christian yeah. McCaffrey. Yeah, people yeah. are afraid of Christian McCaffrey. I mean, you read the comments under, you know, I don't know, some YouTube draft. I mean, everybody's like, what? He took Christian McCaffrey, number one, number two overall. Yeah. Like, people are legitimately afraid of him. Yeah, I, but I'm seeing it in other guys too. You know, some of these end of the first round running backs – 41 42 dollars and when you start doing the math on that i mean you could you could literally buy swift for about that price delvin cook for that price and add in like a 34 dollar running back to let's just say kamara because i'm going to talk about him and you could have all three of those guys and it's going to be about 118 120 dollars and there's a lot of wide receivers out there so if you're really hankering for strong RBs, it's actually something that you can do this year. 
And in years past, it was just really difficult to do that. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is the, the wide outs, I think, are, are plentiful, like wide outs, like 20 through 40 in the, in the rankings. A number of really good wide outs that are selling, that those guys are selling somewhere between like 10 to $20. So when you start putting together a game plan of guys, there's so many guys you could choose from in that range that you're seeing $14 or $18. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of guys you can back them up with too, because to me, there's, there's a number of guys that could blow up in that range that fit within a, a budget. So that's interesting. So, you, you know, you put those two together, you could have some really good running backs, but still have some really viable blow up wide receivers. Um, and then the third one I would say is, you know, in, especially in single league um, quarterback leagues, uh, prices are so cheap for these guys, especially these mid-tier quarterbacks. The first auction I did this year, Tom Brady went for $3. And wow. I'm like, Why didn't I bid $4? <laughs> but I've seen a number of, uh, there's a number of good quarterbacks that are selling for 3 or $4 that are anywhere in the range of, um, you know, like 9 to 13 something like that. So you just got to be ready. You just got to be open and ready if you're looking for a guy in that range because all of a sudden one's going to pop up and guys aren't bidding and boom, you can have one of those for three or $4. Talked about the fear factor with Christian McCaffrey. I think that that may extend to Dalvin Cook as well. Um, just over the, you know, people think that they can predict injuries. I mean, these guys have had injuries for multiple years, sure. but what 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 else would you attribute that dynamic to where the running backs seem to be cheaper, not only in auction, but also in season long. But I mean, do you think that it's like the, the, um, the, the thought process behind like zero RB and how that is sort of caught on or, you know, people leaning toward just drafting wide receiver heavy more and more, or I mean, what, to what would you attribute that? Uh, the first thing I'd say is recency effect. There's been a lot of injuries on the top guys over the years and, and that, you know, when that torpedoes your your fantasy team, when you don't have Barkley, mm -hmm. McCaffrey, mm -hmm. Henry, mm -hmm. Cook, you know, all these guys have been injured. You just have that bad taste in your mouth. So it's easy to just not want to um, go that route and go with um, wide receivers that typically don't get injured as much, unless you're a Michael Thomas fan. <laughs> but you, you know what I see, you know, that what I'm saying there. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's part of it, but I think guys that are zero RB um, guys that, that uh, advocate for that. I think that's definitely part of it too, because you can certainly put together some really, really strong teams with just zero RB. Yeah. It's interesting. I, you know, I'm one of those guys that typically leans wide receiver when it's close in the rankings, but I agree with you guys that, that this year, I mean, you can start off drafts, even in snake RB, RB, RB. And I think be fine. You know, you start like Dalvin Kamara, ETN or something like that. Like that's, that's a really nice start, I think for a lot. So yeah, it's definitely an interesting point there on the way the landscape is shaping up. The other thing that you mentioned about quarterbacks, I mean, it's not sexy to take these pocket passers and you know, I'm as much as fault as anyone. I, I don't love taking uh, Brady. I don't love taking uh, Stafford, Carr, Cousins, even Burrow. Like These guys need to run so hot on efficiency to match the guys who run and throw that I find it hard. But like Rodgers and Brady shoved it down my throat last year. I mean, they were, they were incredibly <laughs> efficient. And those were the teams that I think ended up winning. So if you hit on the right efficiency on some of these pocket guys, I think it makes sense. But there's a ton of hype, obviously, around the Kyler, Lamar, Hertz, Lance, and those guys, I believe in auction are probably going to get outsized on pricing versus the pocket passers. Well, what I've seen, and I know, I know the pricing in NFFC really well, cause that's what I've been doing. And even those prices on the running quarterbacks, eight, nine, maybe $10. I had Kyler Murray the other night for $8. And I had one budgeted for about four, but I'm like this is Kyler Murray for, yeah. for $8. So I, I hit the plus one and I got him. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like, I mean, this, yeah, I mean, Tom Brady for three or Kyler Murray versus eight uh, is just absolutely no brainer for me. But yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Let's talk about one and two dollar guys, because I mentioned stars and scrubs. The difference between preparing for a snake where it's like, well, I know <laughs> that X sleeper or X guy nobody wants is going to be available to me in round 15. Like, I, I just know in auction, it only takes a couple other guys to like a player him to no longer be a one or two one or two dollar player 
So like guys like uh, Pacheco or Pickens or Damian Pierce or Wandale, like all these guys have a ton of hype right now. I It's hard for me to see them actually going for one or two dollars against competent players. So in auction, it's different. The end game, the one and two dollar range to me than Snake. What do you think about the one and two dollar range generally and then specifically to this year? Yeah, it's unfortunate. Some of those guys you named aren't going to go for one or two dollars. They had been. Uh, Wandale was one of my favorites for two bucks. I've been getting him for two. Um, Isaiah McKenzie was another one. No one was doing anything with him for a while. Uh, and some of the uh, high upside backup running backs, same kind of thing. And, and you know, I bought Pierce last week for five dollars as a third running back. That's not going to go for five dollars anymore. You know, a guy like him is going to go somewhere between like eight and ten. So it, the, the hype does hurt those one or two dollar players. Um, but you still have to. To me, the, the primary thing with that is as looking at. If you don't have any other information, look at the end of a draft, of a redraft with the same number of players, about the last 60 or 70 players. And those are the guys that are typically going to be one or two dollars. So I'd start identifying who are those guys that you like the most for that. Uh, that's what I do to prepare. Um, although I know price is pretty much at that point, if there's because of the drafts that I've completed, who's essentially going to be one or two dollars. Uh- let, let me throw you some players at you because these were guys that I thought maybe like I think they should go in round 10, 11, 12 of snake drafts, but there's like no buzz on them. So, for example, uh, DJ Chark, uh, Christian Kirk, Two. Jahan Dotson, uh, Albert O, Ooh. maybe even like Sky Moore. Maybe it's wishful thinking, but do you think like those type of guys go for one or two dollars? Yeah, DJ, DJ Chark does. He's, he's been basically a two dollar player. Sky Moore, no, he's been he's on Kansas City, seeing all those sweet routes he runs. <laughs> um, he's been more than that, five or six. Um, Alberto, tight ends usually don't go for that much. They'll go for a little more in the FFPC, but yeah. in regular uh, PPR leagues, he's going to be a one or two dollar player, especially because he he had a little bit of negative news come out about him with mm-hmm. the one or two dollars. So yeah. that's the guy, yeah. Especially the guys with a little bit of negative about them. Those are the easiest guys to get for a dollar or two. You mm-hmm. still believe in them. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it's just guys that don't have the buzz on them. Because I every time I get into an auction, there's like one other guy who's reading ETR and reading all my tweets and he knows, right? And so I, I try, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get this guy for a dollar. It only takes one other uh, dude to just be like, oh, I'm going to start bidding. Yeah. You know what I mean? So You, you, you know who's going to be going for like one or two dollars real soon is uh, Antonio Gibson. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, one of the things I would say, um, even though you, you, you should come into an auction with a list of guys and be prepared for the end game like that. One of the most important things you need to do is see how much guys are bidding at the beginning of the auction, because if there's a lot of, um, money being spent, a lot of, um, stars and scrubs strategy going on, there's going to be a lot less money at the end. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, with just a little bit of experience, right? If it's if it's a lot of overpaying going on, you're going to have more one or two dollars players available, yeah. okay? But if guys are holding back, and some of these guys are sitting on forty or fifty dollars at the end, it gets really hard to buy some of those guys because they have a lot of spots to fill, and they're going to be these guys that spend three or four dollars to fill their rosters with a number of players, and you know that's a fine strategy, but you have to look out for that mm-hmm. to know whether you should be spending more at the front of the draft or you can see a lot, a number of one or two players will be available at the end. Yeah. I was going to ask you about end game strategy. Cause sometimes I find myself in a spot where it's like, damn, I wish I had saved a little bit more money here. Cause we're seeing some outrageous deals now, but everybody's out of money. And so these, the, whoever had money left is like getting these outrageous deals for one or $2. Do yeah. you go out of your way to try to save some bucks to try to get to $3 in the end game to try to price someone else out? I, I, when I'm so super aggressive, it's really hard for me to do that. My friends tease me about that because they know I, you know, I love to bid and I get over aggressive sometimes. So it's hard for me to save some money. Uh, and I don't do it very often where I have enough to be one of those guys to just pick off those guys at the end. Once in a while I do, it just depends what construction I have going on. If I feel like I have, let's say three or four studs on the team and I know I can fit in guys in certain slots that are really good flex players yet, 
then I'll sit back. Like one of my, fa- I shouldn't ever say this, but one of the, my favorite things to do in FFPC auctions is sit on some of these tight ends that I think would be a good flex player. That's only three or $4 mm-hmm. because some of these guys are great for that spot and are cheap when I'm going studs and, and, and scrubs. So yeah, you, don't, you don't have to be afraid to give away all your secrets. No, no one watches this show. No one listens to this. <laughs> Friends like to text me, say, all right, I'm definitely not going to miss this podcast. <laughs> no, it's coming. Yeah. yeah. By the way, Jack's referring to FFPC, which is tight end premium, AKA mm-hmm. 1.5 points for receptions for tight ends. One more $1 uh, guy. I got to throw at you. Jack. Tell me I can at least get Nico Collins for a dollar. I mean, can I get Nico Collins for a dollar? Uh, he'll be at least $3. Jesus. Yeah. The, the real good auction guys. I mean, we're, the guys that get the hype are the guys that are going up a dollar or two like that. The, these guys yeah. I mentioned where they might've been a dollar that Nico won't be anymore. His, his opportunity looks really good in Houston. Inflation. Okay. Budget in three, Adam. That's all you got to do. <laughs> okay. Um, Evan asked you about price enforcing a little bit. I just want to follow up there on price enforcing. Basically what we're referring to here is, hey, I may not love this guy. Uh, I may not even want him, but I cannot let someone else get away with getting this guy for $10 under what he should be going for. I feel this way all the time to the point where, A, I want to make this go faster because I'm impatient or whatever. I just like snap bid someone. If I think they're viable, I'll just snap bid them up to what I think they should be, even if they don't. I don't want them. And then I let these animals go from there and bid against each other. What is your overall take on price enforcing? I love to do it. Um, I, if it's a player, well, let's, let's put it this way. Whoever comes up, the first question I'm going to ask is if I buy this guy, does he fit in the plan? Okay. If a certain guy comes up and it's funny you mentioned Antonio Gibson, because that's a name I was going to say, if he comes up, I am not bidding because I am not going to get caught. Right. on Antonio Goodson, unless it's a couple dollars, which still isn't going to happen. Okay. So there are some guys I just refuse to bid on because I'm not going to get caught. I got burned a few times early in my uh, auction career, learned a lesson. And that's one of the reasons why I say you have to know where these guys sell at. Because if I'm going, let's just say a guy's going to go for typically average price of 14, I'll make sure the price is at least 11 or 12. And it's someone that I would buy to fit in the plan if I'm going to bid it up. And I'm, after that, fine. I'll let it go for what it should be as his value. But every time I bid, I expect to win, even when I don't want them. So I know when to stop. Yeah. Hard yeah, yeah. lessons learned. For sure. And and price enforcement on guys like Antonio is dangerous because the price is the latest news and what people think of him mm-hmm. lately. And so you end up um, yeah. bidding on guys who are who are falling in value. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Definitely when you put it, when you pick a guy to put him up for bid, is it sort of the the same sort of line of thinking? Like, I mean, you have to be willing to to get him yourself, right? Well, yeah. I'm never going to put up a guy for a dollar or two if I think the possibility is there that I'm going to get him if I don't want him. Mm-hmm. So at the end game, I almost never I, I never put up a guy that um, that I could get stuck with. I'll put up a guy. Here, here's another example. Um, I think this is a great one because DK Metcalf, a lot of guys don't like the Seattle team, Mm -hmm. right? Because of their quarterback situation. He's a guy I would not get close to what I think his expected price could be if I don't want him. Okay. Because I could easily get DK Metcalf and I might not want him because there's enough guys out there that are just hands off the Seattle wide receivers. So for him, I might get close to about $4 and then just stop. Because at some point I'd take him, but I don't want to get close to the uh, average value on him. If yeah. I him. What about guys who you know aren't going to go for a dollar or two, but would you still nominate someone that you want? There, there's I, I almost never nominate someone that I actually want. I just throw someone out there and let the wolves kind of battle it out with someone that I don't want. I, you don't have to reveal this if you don't want to, but uh, should we be nominating uh, guys that we actually don't want even in the early game? Uh, well, one of the things I said in my article that, um, uh, one of my favorite strategies that I do is put up somebody early that's mid tier that I do want. Okay. Because mm-hmm. I have noticed in the first round, especially the first one to eight nominations, some guys are just hesitant bidders. Mm-hmm. It's, it's unbelievable to me. I've seen this happen over and over and over where guys think, oh, you know, what's that mid-tier guy going to go for? He's not 
Justin Jefferson, and there's plenty of other guys. So I'm not going to bid on them. And, and a couple times recently, I've gotten these mid tier players for like three or four dollars less in the first round. I'm like, that's hmm. unbelievable. I don't get it. Yeah. But it's it's just something the way guys bid. If they're not ready to roll. And they're expecting big numbers, guys, to come out at the beginning. I put someone up there. Yeah, see, I would almost expect most people to come out guns blazing, but I, I can totally see that 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 dynamic where guys are cautious on the first few guys, like because they they think they're going to go for too much or whatever. Yeah, because yeah. everybody's got everybody's got all their money, you know. Well, that's why you got to know what his price ought to be. Exactly. Right. Well, I- I'm curious what you consider mid-tier. Like, I really like Amon Ross St. Brown. I really like uh, Juju Smith-Schuster this year. I, I, I like Brees Hall. Uh, is that what you would consider kind of a, a mid-tier player? That's that's absolutely one. In fact, um, like, I don't know, two weeks ago I did an auction, and I thought, eh, I'm going to put up Juju and see what he sells for. And it was in the first round, and I bought him for 14. The next draft I was in, he went up much later, and it was 18 or 19. Mm-hmm. That's the perfect example. Of yeah. one of the guys so yeah and there's so many guys in that range that are viable you know upside players like that so just yeah. pick, pick one and go with it and even if you start like that you can still do stars and scrubs right like that doesn't preclude you from doing stars and scrubs if you get a mid-range no. guy early right yeah. well i say that because you are going to have if you go stars and scrubs there's only so many stars you can buy sure. you're going to have those numbers there that you of guys you still want to plug in because if you love saint brown plug them in and adjust right yeah. and just in your game planning ahead of time to see what else fits uh last question i have for you here today is this whole idea of zero rb i'm sure you've heard all the r zero rb zealots i'm curious if you think that it works better worse uh the same in auction do you see people trying to execute zero rb in auction what do you think about all that yeah, it works well in some type of auction drafts, especially the the drafts where you'd have four or five wideouts in a lineup. You know, guys, then then wideouts are are really um, viable and um, valuable. So it, it can work. To me, I I figure out how much I'm going to budget for the four or five guys, and then the hard thing is what running backs fit the money that are left, and you have to. You have to know that ahead of time. Am I happy with guys such as Michael Carter? Or now da- Damian Pierce looks to be a perfect one for that because he'll be about 8 to 10, I, I would guess, in a couple of weeks. But who are the guys that I'm, I'm happy with that, that work in that and to see whether it does work with the wide receivers that um, fit inside your plan? Yeah. I mean, I guess my question is like some of these zero RB candidates, like, um, you know, I don't know, uh, AJ Dillon, um, Ramondre Stevenson, Chase Edmonds, uh, Melvin Gordon, James Cook, uh, Damian Pierce, you mentioned, like, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't really have a great feel for how much those guys go for. But if you could get those guys relatively cheap and stack up on wide receivers, I don't see why it couldn't work, specifically in the formats that Jack talked about, where you start a lot of wide receivers and it's full PBR. I, I think yeah. that would be viable for sure. Yeah, well, it can work, but I can tell you Ramondre is going to be going up after positive mm-hmm. news about his role. Yeah. Right now he's probably about $10, eight, 9 or $10 with what I've seen. Um, Michael Carter maybe about 5 but he had positive news yesterday too. Mm-hmm. Edmonds has been routinely about 8 or 9 So, mm-hmm. you know, you can find some guys, and if you stack up three or four of them, if, if you have sufficient money, uh, uh, yeah, it, it can work. All right. We've said it all on auctions. For more in-depth discussion on how to get ready for your auction draft, head to the Draft Kit. Jack's article is indeed in there. Jack, big luck out there uh, grinding the circuit. I love this. They should make a movie about the season-long grinders who travel all over the country uh, grinding these season-long drafts. It's so great. Uh, big, big good luck this year. Tell the people where they can find you if you want to be found. I don't even know if you want to be found, but if you want to be found, tell the people where they can find you. <laughs> Well, I particularly want to be found at the law office of Jack L. Hahn in case they have a business problem. Okay, perfect. Business litigation. Perfect. Um, and my Twitter handle is uh, at Jack Hahn Law. So, um, 
I, I don't post a lot. I, I'm not a, one that usually posts a lot of uh, helpful information, mostly just a smart ass on Twitter as Evan, you know, that's how we met <laughs> <laughs> years ago. Um, yep. but yeah, that's where I can be found. He was right. making fun of me for uh, trading a, um, a high, an early dynasty pick for uh, Chris Hogan. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I mean, he was right, but his uh, his response to that was, "Is Silva new?" Yeah, <laughs> that's what he asked. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on, Jack. Good luck to all the auction grinders out there. Hope this was helpful for Thanks, guys. Jack for Evan for producer Luke. I'm Adam. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>